So now that we've got a feel for those radicals, we're going to start combining them in different ways. First one that we're going to look at is if we multiply these together. Multiply and eventually simplify. We want to have it in a nice form. So we're going to look at this first example. If I evaluate these roots individually, what do I get out? Square root of 9 is 3, and the square root of 4 is 2. So if we multiply those together, we get 6. Now let's see if we combine them underneath one radical. What is 9 times 4? 36, and what is the square root of 36? What number do we need to multiply by itself to get us there? So what does that tell me with these? If I have non-negative radicands, so either zero or they're positive, then we can combine those radicands underneath one radical. We can combine the multiplication underneath one root. Sometimes it's helpful to do that. Sometimes it's helpful to evaluate them individually. It's just whatever is going to benefit us more. So let's look. Doing a few of these, I have positive radicands, and I can't evaluate them individually, so we should try multiplying them and see if we can. So 7 times 5 gives us 35. Is it a perfect square? No, pretty darn close. If we had one more, we'd be there, but we can't evaluate that nicely, so we'll leave it. And for part B, I've got positive radicands. 8 times 8 is 64. Or we could have written it as 8 squared underneath. So what value comes out there? 8. Pretty straightforward. Again, for part C, I can't evaluate those roots individually. So let's see if we multiply them. What comes out? So straight across the top, I've got 2 times 4 will give me 8. And 3 times 5 down below gives me 15. Which is not a perfect square, but we tried. And for part D... We have some expressions involved, and we're assuming, again, that we're not taking square root of a negative for whatever values of x we're plugging in. So what do we get out? The square root of 2x times this quantity, 3x minus 1. And why did we need parentheses around that second piece? I have a difference on the inside. So to simplify, we actually have to distribute 2x to each of those terms. So we're looking at the square root of 6x squared minus 2x. But again, not a perfect square. We can't evaluate. We'll have to leave it there. So go ahead and take a through d of those tries. Multiply and simplify if you can. So with the first, we couldn't evaluate individually square root of 3 or square root of 11. And when we multiply, we've got the square root of 33, we can't simplify it any farther. We would have to approximate it. But for part B, I'm looking at the square root of 5 squared, which is 25. Whichever form you like to see it in, you can write it as such. So what evaluates out? Positive radicand 5. For part C, again, evaluated individually. Nothing's coming out of there. They're not perfect squares. But when we multiply, we're looking at what up top? 6 times 5 is 30, all over 77. And again, we can't simplify. We would have to approximate that thing. So we'll leave it. And very last, we're assuming our variables are nice things for us. I've got x times that quantity, x plus 1. And again, we can distribute c in that different form, but it's still not a perfect square on the inside, so we can't evaluate any farther. So when we have those positive radicands, or non-negative rather, it could be zero, we can combine them underneath one with that multiplication. All right. So we also can do the reverse. If it helps me to break up my singular radicand into two different ones that I can evaluate, we can do that as well. So a square root radical expression is simplified when its radicands has no factors that are perfect squares. So once we have broken it down into things that we can't evaluate nicely, we would have to approximate, then we're done. So looking at part A. 18 is not a perfect square, but it's composed of factors that are. 
how can I break up 18 into a perfect square and some other number? I could break 18 up into 9 times 2. And 9 is a perfect square, 2 is not. So I could even split that farther and say, well, this is the square root of 9 times the square root of 2. Since it's positive radicand underneath, we can split it up. And the first one evaluates. The square root of 9 is 3. And the square root of 2, we would have to approximate and have an irrational number. So we'll just leave it precisely as 3 square roots of 2. And it's helpful off on the side to write out some perfect squares as you're working through these in the beginning because you might not be able to notice, you know, what is the largest perfect square that I have as a factor. If you have it written out, it's a little bit easier to see. So let's look at part B. 48 is not a perfect square right now, neither is T. And what factors can we break 48 up into? We want to go for the largest perfect square and something else. So it's composed of 16 and 3, and t as well. Okay, So we have positive radicand, and we're assuming our variables are going to be nice things for us. So we can split that up into square root of 16 and the square root of 3t. So what we'll evaluate out of that first radical? 4. And again, irrational if we're going to approximate, so we'll just leave it there. Okay, so we're just doing the reverse of exactly what we've just done. So, for 20t squared. So, t squared, is that one a perfect square? Yeah, of t. If I take t and I square it, I get t squared. But 20, it doesn't have a number that I can square and give 20. But I can break it up. Largest perfect square and something else. 4 and 5. And I can group together, since multiplication is commutative, I can put that in any order that I want. So I'm going to group together the perfect squares and the leftovers, things that I can't actually evaluate. So what quantity do we need to square to get 4t squared? 2t. And again, we're still left with root 5 on the outside. Okay, hopefully you're catching the patterns. For part D, I don't have some quantity squared right now, but can I turn it into that? This guy, this trinomial, is a perfect square trinomial. And the factors that we need, square root of the first one, square root of the second one, and the sign in the middle is negative. So when we evaluate that, yeah, I've got a perfect square underneath. It's going to come out just to be x minus 3. All right, part E. What about this one? Can I rewrite that radicand as some quantity squared? Yes. 36 is a perfect square of 6, and x squared is a perfect square of x. So when we evaluate that out, what do we get? 6x. Because we could evaluate it individually. The square root of 36 gives me 6. The square root of x squared gives me x. We can always check if I square that value. Do I get back to the inside? Yes. For part F, it's a little bit different. We have a trinomial, and I have a constant 3 out on the front. So before I try to factor, I want to see, is there anything in common that I can take out of everything? A factor of 3. And when we do that, what are we left with? x squared plus 2x plus 1. So now that we took out that greatest common factor, what about this trinomial? Can we factor that one any farther? We can. It's actually a perfect square trinomial. Of what values? I need a constant x, constant 1, sign on the inside, positive. So we can split that up into square root 3 and the square root of x plus 1 squared. The perfect squares and the leftovers. So what's evaluating out? I've got root 3 that I would have to approximate, so I'm just going to leave it. And coming out of here, I'm left with x plus 1. So go ahead and take the next few and simplify them. Break them down as far as you can go. 
So the first one, 32 isn't a perfect square, but we can break it up into a perfect square and something else. So what is the largest perfect square? 16 and 2. So again, we could split it up. Square root 16, square root 2. Square root of 16 evaluates to 4. And we would have to approximate root 2, so we're going to leave him. For 92, it's not a perfect square right now, but we could break it up into 4 and 23. And if you're wondering where to start with these, if you look at 92 and you try to find factors that are perfect squares, if it's even, the first number that we should try to divide by is what? 4. That's our first um, perfect square that I could actually evaluate out. So whenever I have an even radicand, it's at least divisible by 4, and we should try evaluating that first. All right, so what comes out of here, evaluating out, we get a factor of 2, and the leftovers, we still have root 23. For part C, largest perfect square that we can take out of 128, 64 and left over 2. T is not a perfect square, so I'm going to group him with 2. And 8 times 8 gives me 64. We'll evaluate that out. And the leftovers, 2T. For part D, 63. How do I want to break that up into a perfect square and some leftovers? 9 times 7. And X squared, that is a perfect square. So what evaluates out of here? 3, an x, and what do I have left over? Root 7 still hanging on. For part E, what happens with this one? They're both perfect squares underneath. So the square root of 81 is 9. Square root of m squared is m. Done. Easy enough. And for the last one, can I make it fit the form of some quantity squared? So we need to look and see if it's a perfect square trinomial. And it is. We need an x and a 7, square root of the first, square root of the last, and the sign in the middle is going to be positive. So as we evaluate that, we get out x plus 7. Our radical is undoing that square.